anything you want to ask me. So, how to tame your services, evolving Airbnb's architecture. When I joined Airbnb in 2014, the engineering team was much smaller than less than 100 people. We had this new hire tradition of welcoming employees to the company by having them run underneath what we call a human tunnel. At the end of this tunnel was this large beanbag for the employee to jump onto while we all clapped and cheered. As our engineering team grew, so did the length of the human tunnel. This is an example of our office where the tunnel is extending all the way around the atrium. And to give you a little taste of what this looks like, here's our VP of engineering going through the tunnel. So it's a fun experience getting people excited on their first day. At the time, our office was in San Francisco, headquartered, and all of our engineers are here. But slowly, we began to get more engineering offices throughout the world. Fortunately, we don't have one here in Cape Town yet, but I'd love it. Because our engineering presence became global, it was really important that we were able to scale our engineering team to thousands of engineers now. Our product was also growing as well, so scaling our Airbnb products to different verticals became a challenge. My name is Jessica, and I'm a software engineer working on our infrastructure team, part of our core services. I lead the read path architecture for how we want to scale our service-oriented architecture to continue growing for the future. That's my little dog, Stu. Yes, I'll begin by talking about how Airbnb's architecture started with a brief history beginning with our monolithic stage. I'll then go into some scaling challenges that we saw both with the monolith and our service-oriented architecture, or SOA. I'll then cover some of the new patterns and designs that we developed to abstract away some of these services and address the challenges that we saw, and end with lessons learned and key takeaways. Growth, growth, growth. This is a quote that our CTO of Homes often tells us. It's been the motivator for our architecture redesigns, being able to grow our business and grow our engineering team successfully. When Airbnb started in 2008, up until 2016, we were in a monolithic architecture. But in 2016, we realized that there were challenges that could no longer be met by this monolith, so we began our service-oriented architecture migration. This lasted until 2019, and the end of last year, we realized that some of what SOA was trying to solve was still being challenged, so we came up with new design patterns that we'll be discussing later. So about the monolith, for eight years it served us really well. Our monolith is known as monorail because we have a Ruby on Rails application. A monolith is a single tier unit responsible for both client and server side functionality. This meant that our monorail took in requests from our web and mobile clients and responsible for handling the presentation view, the business logic, and data accessing. Monorail then fetched this data from this really fat, large database with housed all of Airbnb's data models. Again, this worked really well for growing the company from a small product into its current global presence. However, as the engineering team grew, what used to be modular and easy to work with soon became complex, tightly coupled, and really hard to untangle. It was a spaghetti mess inside of Monorail. We began to see more incidents in production. Engineers are spending too much time firefighting instead of working on building new features. We also saw a slow um, deploy process. At Airbnb, we like to deploy continuously, but given the speed at Monorail, with tons of engineers making changes in the code base, it often took a magnitude of several hours to get a change out Whereas when I join, it could be done simply in minutes. These challenges led us to realize that our monorail was not scaling with the needs of the growing business and the growing team. So we looked at service-oriented architecture to address these needs. In 2016, we had a hybrid approach of allowing monorail to be in a reduced scope to just the routing and view layer. Through API traffic, we then sent the request out to 
our network of services, where our services are responsible for the business logic, modeling, and data accessing. If we zoom into what this SOA network looks like, we aligned on four different service types. At the bottom layer, we have the data service. Our data services are the gatekeeper, responsible for a particular entity's reads and writes. The layer above is what we call a computed data service. This combines data across multiple contexts and can access its own data stores as well. It reads data from other data services instead of going directly to their data stores. A layer above is what we call the middle tier service. Originally when we began the migration, we didn't think of this as an option, but the migration showed that we had really large pieces of complex business logic that needed to be encapsulated in their own services. And at the highest level, we had the presentation service. This is responsible for synthesizing information from the below services and then serving it to our web and mobile UI. Here's an example of our product description page on Airbnb. If you go to book a particular home, we use various services to show you this end result. There's information about the home, which is served by the home's data service. There's information about pricing, which is computed across various rules in our pricing computed data service. We have validation logic for determining if the home is available in our middle tier service. And putting it all together and showing it to the UI is the checkout presentation service. But in 2018, we were able to get rid of Monorail from our request lifecycle and replace it instead with an API gateway. Our mobile clients request the API gateway and our web clients, we introduced another layer specific for web rendering. Its responsibility was to return HTML back to the web client. And then forward request to the API gateway to populate this data. API gateway then populates the request context by calling out to various middle tier service, middleware services, such as session or authentication data. Then the request gets sent out through our network of the four services in a way that has a strict flow of dependencies. But if you notice, in 2019 is when I say that we ended the migration. We had migrated enough uh, at this point that we instrumented what we call a monorail freeze. This meant that no new features could be added in monorail. All new development must be done in services. But I call this out because 2019 is three years after when we first began the migration. Migrating from monolith to service is timely, is, is costly in terms of time and engineering resources. But we did gain a lot of benefits from this migration and it helped unblock what was looking like a series of doomsdays coming up with monorail. Some wins that we got with an SOA were that we had performance benefits. This is because monorail was in Ruby, which is not as naturally multi-threaded, whereas a lot of our new services were in Java. This allowed us to get the polarization of dependencies, which resulted in lower latency. Our deployment speed increased as well. This was a major driver for why we wanted to do the migration in the first place. With services being independently built, with smaller teams focusing on each one of them, deployments again could be done in a matter of minutes. Other wins included having our code being more modularized and guarded. By placing services, code in the services behind endpoints, we were able to get better observability into the different callers into the particular pieces of code. At Airbnb, we use Thrift as our interface description language, or IDL, and it auto-generates a lot of our server and client-side boilerplate code for us. It also gives us really cool benefits of reliability metrics, such as circuit breaking, rate limiting, and timeouts, all with simple one-line configuration changes. So our code was a lot better protected with SOA. But as any engineer knows, there's always another challenge around the corner. This talk will also have corny analogies to various animals in nature that migrate. The lemming is a migratory rodent, and they migrate when they have scaling challenges, such as overpopulation. For us, we also migrate when we have scaling challenges. And it's because monorail, which was a complex knot where you couldn't figure out what was the end in the beginning, turned into 
our first version of services, which is organized pieces of rope, modularized, we soon realized that in 2019, we had tons of these knots. Now it was looking like a different type of spaghetti mess. But this brings us back to our original driver of growth. We wanted to make sure that we can continue growing the business and continue growing our engineering team. The needs of what we had when we were a few hundred engineers is different than the needs that we were now over a couple thousand. Our migration to SOA v1 looked very similar to how monorail was structured. Our presentation view mapped very closely to the presentation service. Our business logic mapped very closely to the computed data and middle tier services. And the data accessing in active record looked very similar to the CRUD endpoints that we had in our data services. This type of migration served us well because it allowed us to get off monorail quickly and into services. At the time, we didn't have the introspection of all the functionality that Monorail was supporting. It was just this big block of code that no one quite understood. But moving them out into services, it gave us better observability into the functionality and how the pieces were interacting with one another. Doing the migration in this way was important to unblock the needs of what our team had at the time and continue the business growth. But at a certain point, we outgrew our SOA v1. Services then had dozens of dependencies. And it was difficult to understand what was going on anymore. It was no longer that clean graph that we had in mind. And if we see here of our service growth, in 2016, we had around 500 engineers working around 50 services. But as the migration began out of monorail, this soon began to pick up. Whereas now, in 2020, we have over 2,000 engineers and over 500 services. So the rate of our services was growing faster than our rate of our engineers. We did not want each engineer to be responsible for multiple services, so we needed to figure out a way to better scale our engineering velocity as well as the growing business. This brings us to some four specific challenges that we were trying to address that we were seeing with our SOA v1. Developer velocity. This is the speed of which engineers are able to make their changes. In Monorail, developer velocity was hindered because we couldn't deploy our code fast enough. Now, the issue we're seeing with developer velocity is that services have way too many dependencies. It's harder for engineers to get their code done and to figure out what needs to be changed in order to complete a feature. We're having scalability concerns. Our data was not as properly guarded as we intended it to be. Because each service was able to call any other service, our data services had extremely high load. And due to the way that we migrated, optimizing to migrate quickly, we allowed some shortcuts where services were directly accessing the data themselves. This is soon causing problems in our databases for on fire. We also wanted to address the challenge of defect rate. This is a way that we find to improve our product quality through the issues of triaging and addressing bugs. However, our business logic was fragmented across various services, sometimes duplicated or inconsistent with one another. But it was really difficult for us to figure out how to debug these different issues. And finally, Airbnb is trying to expand beyond homes and integrate different new product verticals. However, with each of our services having customly defined schemas and APIs, it was really difficult to add different types of product verticals in a way that was platformizable. So enter what we call SOA v2, new patterns that we're introducing to our SOA to try to address the gaps that we're seeing in our first iteration. This began at the end of last year. So the work described here is still fresh, but I'd like to share it with you anyways. So developer velocity is slowed down. And this is because there are too many dependencies for each service. Our presentation services at that highest level often have dozens, if not more than 30 or 40 services that they call out to get data. Initially, this seemed OK with just a few. But as the migration began, it was clear that having this many dependencies was difficult for the service owner to maintain and tune. 
It was also difficult for us to have good observability into how the data was flowing through our service network when it began to look a really complicated mess like this piece of wire. The pattern that we came to address these concerns was what we called decomposing our presentation services. Herons are birds where some of them migrate and break off into smaller groups, but other herons choose not to migrate and they stay put and they're known as resident herons. For our presentation services, we wanted to take out some of their functionality and put them into other smaller groups while still keeping some of their functionality within the presentation service itself. So what this looks like is that our presentation services became really fat and bloated because they were doing too much functionality. They were responsible for server-driven UI, the data fetching, and business logic that they would apply on the data they fetched. The proposal is to break these out into separate components. Oops. The presentation service would then focus only on the server-driven UI part. The data aggregation would be delegated out to a separate service responsible for optimizing the data loading aspects. Complex business logic would be then removed and put into separate middle tier services that could be used by other services. We found that often presentation services were duplicating the same type of business logic in each of their services, which is not optimal. If we go back to that product description page of when you want to book a home on Airbnb, we have a section here known as home highlights. It has some things that, that are particularly interesting to the home such as this home is really clean or the host is a super host. Super host is a status that we give to our elite tier of hosts that have demonstrated high hospitality. If we look at this in terms of breaking it down in the presentation service, which is currently responsible for displaying all of that information, we now descope the presentation service to focus on the server-driven UI. This would be the layout of this particular module, including the icons and the order. Then, the data fetching would be sent out to that separate data aggregation service. This is fed information about a particular home, the reviews, and the user, all within a single query from that presentation service. We then would pull out the business logic for deciding which highlights to show into a separate business logic service. This allows other product features to use a similar business logic without needing to duplicate it in their respective presentation services. So another challenge, as mentioned before, was the lack of scalability with our data. Our data was not guarded as intended, and there are suboptimal ways that people were accessing the data. Our data services are our largest services at Airbnb with the highest QPS, but a lot of this is not necessary. Oftentimes, a data service is called at least 10, 20 times within a single request due to the various services along the chain accessing that same piece of data. To so enter in the V2 pattern of having that data aggregation service. Caribou migrate, but before they do, they eat a big batch of food before they go on their long journey. We wanted our aggregator service to fetch a big batch of data before it returned it to its clients, and it does so by addressing the problem of not having the access control to a particular piece of data. This is kind of what our SOA looks like right now, where various services are calling our data services, including data services calling other data services, which is bad for encapsulation. But with the V2 pattern of the aggregator, the presentation service makes a single request to this data aggregation service to get all of its data needs. This then fans out to the various data services beneath. The data aggregation service is aware of the relationships between the different entities and can optimize its fetching. Looking into a bit more details, we have a GraphQL interface to our data aggregation service. We put GraphQL as an expressive way to query our APIs. For this particular example, we're asking for information about a reservation, and we want to map this query to particular data sources. The data aggregation service then has these different resolvers that have the mapping. 
for our particular field, such as what is the check-in date of this reservation, what is the first name and picture of the guest and host, they will each map to their respective resolvers. Different entities can map to the same resolver, and the data aggregation service is smart enough to know if the resolver maps to the same data source, to then batch them together to make a single request to that service. Instead of making a request for first name for the guest, picture for the guest, first name for the host, picture for the host, we can instead batch them and to make just one call to our service. The migration to the aggregator doesn't involve changing the API to our presentation service. This is all done beneath the presentation service and is swapping out the dependencies. It changes the presentation service to call that data aggregation service with that single RPC, and instead, the fetching of the data is abstracted away. The data aggregation service is then responsible for optimizing and caching these requests in a way that will help with performance and load to our data services. This brings us to another problem that we have with the poor defect rates. With business logic spread across all our SOA network, it was difficult to understand which service to call for which piece of functionality. Business logic was often inconsistent or half implemented in Monorail and not quite ported over to the service as well. So we introduced a pattern of having our computed data function more as a platform. Wildebeest migrate, and they do so in combination with other animals like gazelles and zebras. Our computed data is a combination of various pieces of data that return a single attribute after applying some sort of transformation logic on top of it. Going back to that example of the product description page, if we look at what it means to be a super host on our platform, there are three different requirements, among some others, but the important ones are that they need to have a certain number of reservations within a time period, the host needs to have high review ratings, and they need to not have any cancellations within that time period. These three are from different data sources, though. Previously, this attribute was calculated in each service independently, where the service would then call out to three data services, apply the business logic, and determine if that host was a super host or not. But in addition to that friction, each of these data services were owned by different teams. This meant there was overhead and needed to integrate and talk to the other different teams and look at their APIs to integrate the same attribute that was used across multiple services. We then wanted to change this and make our computed data function more as a platform. Instead of having to write data loading code to get information from these three data sources, we wanted to have a more config-based way. We allow clients to specify the data attribute they want and say which service it comes from. This is simply done in a config language, and then the computed data platform is responsible for figuring out how to optimize the fetching of this data. The client team is then responsible for implementing the business logic, which is sort of just a lambda function that takes in the input of the requested data sources. This is an easy way for a team to specify, here's the data I want, here's the transformation that I want to happen, without needing to focus on how to actually fetch the data itself. This also allows us to have optimizations when requesting multiple fields to batch them together into just a few requests to or below data services. Further optimizations that we want to do with our second iteration of SOA is putting more of our online to the offline world. For those three sources, they're instead calculated from an offline pipeline. We could then apply an indexing framework so that our computer data can read from that instead. So note this is only possible for fields that can tolerate eventual consistency, but doing an evaluation, we realize that this is many of them. So we have a good way to improve our latency as well as reliability by having these computed offline. 
The migration to this computed data service is really simple. Instead of the presentation going to the individual services, which claim to have the business logic for this data, we instead route them to the computed data service as a platform. We then have a way to admit the responses of these two different paths through Kafka events that then get consumed by this offline framework. The offline framework allows us to compare the two with a query-based language in a way to ensure that we aren't introducing mismatches during this migration. And finally, of those four challenges, the last one is that it was difficult for us to onboard new verticals. Airbnb is into acquisitions, such as acquiring Hotel Tonight. But once we acquire these new tech stacks and services, it was often costly to integrate them. Each service has a custom API that was defined by the engineers. And it was great for migrating out into monorail. But then as the services began to talk to one another, it was then clear that it was difficult to work with hundreds of different services that had different APIs and schemas. This is the motivation for our SOA v2 pattern of service blocks. Tuna fish migrate, and when they do so, it's in a school moving along as block units. We wanted to group our service together like a school, or known as these service blocks. So for our hotel tonight, when we acquired them, they had their own set of services. But both a hotel and an Airbnb home have similar information of what we need to show when a user would want to book them. However, integrating them all pairwise with each other seemed like a really big, complicated mess. Instead, if the services that were similar to each other defining the information about these accommodations could be grouped and put behind a unified API, it would make the integration a lot easier for not only hotel tonight, but additional accommodation verticals that we want to onboard to Airbnb. So what this looks like within our four service types is that we put a grouping around different computed mid-tier and data services. This logical grouping is jointly responsible for a particular cohesive domain or entity. Instead of the data aggregation or other services directly calling the services internal to the block, we instead route them to calling only at the high block level layer. What this looks like is within this block, we create what we call a facade service. This facade service is responsible for being the unified interface for both reads and writes to the block. The services internal to the block are called by this facade service, but from the client perspective, everything beneath the facade service is a black box. The clients don't need to know the internals of how they're calculated. They only interact with the unified API that the facade service provides. Within each different block, we have the same principle, so each of the facades look very similar to each other. We don't need to worry about looking into custom schemas or APIs when dealing with these various blocks. Within the block, services can call one another, but we have a rule that services cannot call other services external to the block or other data sources outside of the block. Recognizing, though, that blocks do need information from other blocks, they can interact by calling the facade services of those other blocks. So the facade services are really the gatekeeper of these particular entities, and anything beneath is internal to that particular block. Putting this together with some of the other V2 attributes that we have, the presentation service with the server-driven UI then calls the data aggregation. And the data aggregator service calls out to the unified APIs within these blocks, but not any of the internal services. We recognize, however, that not all services may belong in blocks, or at least not initially. So we do allow the data aggregation service to call out to these services. There may be a time when the services graduate or form their own block, but we aren't mandating that every single service at Airbnb needs to be in a block quite yet. <laughs> 
Looking into how the facade would operate and the computer data as a platform would operate, we realized that there are a lot of similarities. So instead, we combine the two, the facade service and the data platform, into the same service. This is because they had similar goals of wanting to fetch data and batch them in optimized ways. For the facade service, it has both read and write endpoints. The read endpoint will then go to the various internal services and can also apply the computed data logic. For the write endpoints, we put similar write validation in that facade service that can fetch out information from the below internal services. But again, from the client perspective, everything that happens beneath is a black box. The clients only need to add their logic to the computed data platform or the right part of the facade service and not need to worry about any of the block internals. The migration to blocks is difficult, though. As mentioned before, data services have dozens, if not over 100 dependencies of other services directly calling them. To uphold that principle of only calling the facade service and not the internal service requires a lot of changes. But we recognize that this long-term effort will have benefits. We hope it's not another three-year migration, like our SOAV1. But with our data aggregation service being built in parallel, we can get the benefits of that calling the blocks. So our clients will only need to make one migration, either as a presentation service to the data aggregation service, or as a service like a mid-tier to the facades itself. So which blocks are we piloting? We decided to go into really the core components of Airbnb. The users, the homes, and the pricing and availability. We recognize that these are large domains and responsible for a lot of the functionality of our products. But we think without these large blocks, blocks wouldn't be as impactful. We're working closely with these three different units to ensure that the APIs for these different blocks are consistent. This brings us to the question of when to do all this migration. This bird is an Arctic tern, and it has the longest migration journey throughout its lifetime out of any animal on this planet. It migrates over two million kilometers throughout its life, which is like going from here to the moon and back three times. So a migration in architecture for software is similar to this million kilometer migration. We just finished our migration into SWAV1. Why are we embarking on the second version? Again, growth, 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 growth. Our CTO is hammering that into our heads that we need to continue accelerating the growth of the Airbnb product, as well as continuing to grow our team. The needs of the team for a 10-person company to 100 to 1,000, and for us, hopefully dozens of thousands soon, will change. So we need to be able to evolve our architecture to meet the evolving needs of our growth in the product and the growth of the team. Putting this all together, here's what our SWAV2 looks like to address these challenges that we saw with SWAV1. We hope that it'll enable growth by separating out the presentation service into focusing on server-driven UI. This should help with develop better developer velocity. Data aggregation is then only sent into one particular service, which calls the various facades within the different blocks. The facades can call each other, and there can be other services outside the block that are still abstracted away by our data aggregation service. We hope by introducing these tiers that it would be a much manageable way for our SOA network to continue to grow with the speed of which we need to continue building our business. So even though we started end of last year, we have seen some initial results. Some of the initial paths that our data aggregation service has migrated showed an improvement of 30% lower latency. This is comparing presentation services would then call out to the various data services directly against the B2 pattern of using that GraphQL aggregator and making a single query to get all the data for multiple entities. Our computed data platform has shown positive results in faster engineer velocity as well. 
In v1, if you wanted to add a particular data attribute, you would implement it in your own service and hope that no other service had similar business logic. But now in v2, there's a clear place for it to put in this computed data platform. Each block will have a computed data platform and would have a single data aggregation service for our SOA network, making these two as really powerful pieces to continue growing our team and the business. So the one sentence that I think is important to take away is to design your service architecture to enable the current growth needs. This means not over-engineering for something 10 years from now. The needs of today and tomorrow are different from the needs from the far future. It's understandable that the growth needs will evolve, which means your architecture will evolve as well. But designing for what challenges are most important for you right now is important to being able to unlock developer velocity and the growth of your business. Going back to the old days of when the engineering team was small, it's been a really great journey to see how Airbnb has managed to grow in both its business and its engineering team. The road for our SOA V2 is not quite paved yet, but we have an idea of where we want to go, and hopefully I can share more in a future scale comp of the results that we've seen from our SOA V2 migration. Thanks for listening.